When we are talking about nuclear weapons during the Cold War, we often focus on the weapons created by the United States and the Soviet Union, and the threat of mutually assured destruction that was created by the huge nuclear stockpiles of these two superpowers. But less thought is often given to the third nation to acquire nuclear weapons during the Cold War, namely the United Kingdom. And while we are all familiar with the story of the Manhattan Project that gave the Americans their nuclear bomb in 1945, and the Soviet spy operation that led the Soviets to get the bomb in 1949, very few know the story of the first British bomb. While the British helped the Americans build the first atomic weapons, Britain was still only the third nation to build its own atomic bomb. But why did Britain trail so far behind? After the Americans had built their bomb, they were soon to understand that this represented an entirely new form of warfare, and that other nations would be quick to try and acquire nuclear bombs of their own. Therefore, the United States should do all that it could to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons so that it could maintain a global nuclear monopoly as long as possible. And so Congress passed the Atomic Energy Act of 1946, which prevented the United States from sharing any information related to atomic weapons with any other country, even their previous allies. This was deeply infuriating to Britain, who saw the Americans as ungrateful since during World War II, they had shared all of the research of their own atomic weapons they had gathered from their deceptively named Tube Alloys Program. But why did Congress want to stop the sharing of atomic information with Britain, one of America's closest allies? Well, there were two reasons. First, the United States wanted to stop the spread of atomic information and didn't think that the British Atomic Project would be secure enough to stop information from leaking, especially to the Soviet Union. These fears were proved correct when it was revealed that the Soviets were using British scientists on the Manhattan Project with communist sympathies to steal atomic secrets. For example, Alan Nunn May, a British scientist who worked on the Manhattan Project, was convicted of spying for the Soviets in 1946, while more famously, Klaus Fuchs, a German-born scientist who worked for the British on the Tubes Alloy Program and later the Manhattan Project, also confessed to being a Soviet spy. All these leaks show that the British nuclear program was unsecure and contributed to the Soviets being able to build their own atomic bomb and become the world's second nuclear power in 1949. The other reason the Americans were reluctant to assist the British nuclear project was that the United States was worried about how the British might actually use an atomic bomb. At this point, the British Empire was beginning to collapse and the US weren't about to give the British an atomic bomb that they might use to prop up their empire. But the British couldn't take no for an answer, as they desperately wanted an atomic bomb of their own, as Britain having its own nuclear weapons would ensure strategic independence from the United States, and would ensure Britain's status as the world's third great power. Also, even though a nuclear weapons program would be extremely expensive, it would still be cheaper than having a large conventional army. In the 1950s, Britain was still holding on to a vast empire, with colonies around the world in the Caribbean, Africa and Asia. For example, in 1958, there were still 100,000 British troops stationed in the Middle East alone, and with the Korean War and the Allied occupation of Germany to add to this, the United Kingdom was spending about 7-10% to of its GDP on defence. And so the British government thought that by having a nuclear bomb as a deterrent, they could reduce the size of their armed forces without risking the nation's security. At this point, the British government was led by the Labour Party under Prime Minister Clement Attlee. This was a government known for expanding the British welfare state, helping to establish the National Health Service, or NHS, and other welfare programs. As such, there were some in the Labour government who opposed the nuclear weapons program and said that the money would be better spent in other areas of the economy. But it was Labour Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan who eventually persuaded Attlee that a British nuclear program was needed to secure Britain's strategic independence from the Americans, saying, We've got to have this bloody thing, whatever it costs, and we've got to have a bloody Union Jack on top of it. And with that, £100 million was allocated to the project, with scientist William Penny who had worked on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos as its director. It would take the British five years to refine enough uranium for an atomic test, but once that was done, 
they now needed to select a place to test the bomb. Unlike the US, which had plenty of space for atomic weapons testing, the UK had to look to its dominions for a suitable testing ground, which they found in Australia. And so, on the 3rd of October 1952, on a small group of islands off the coast of Western Australia, the British were finally ready to test their first atomic bomb. By this point, Clement Attlee was no longer Prime Minister, and had been replaced by the return of Winston Churchill to a second term. According to popular legend, Churchill had two letters ready to send to head atomic scientist William Penny once the test had been completed. With one ending, thank you Dr. Penny, if it failed, and the other ending, thank you Sir William, if it was a success. The Sir for success reflected that if the test was successful, then Penny was to be given a knighthood. With preparations complete, all that remained was to finally test the weapon. With seemingly Britain's place as an international great power and strategic independence resting on the success or failure of this one enterprise. All the equipment had to be precisely calibrated, and the explosion had to be properly documented to show the world that Britain had detonated its own nuclear weapon. Once everything was ready, and the last scientists had retreated to safety, all that remained was to start the countdown and actually trigger the bomb. And with that, the test was a success, with a detonation of about 25 kilotons of TNT, which was about the same yield as the first American Trinity test before the more powerful bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The successful detonation meant Britain had become the world's third nuclear power, but only a month later, the US detonated the first of a next generation of nuclear bombs, the hydrogen bomb, with a yield of 10.4 megatons, or about 400 times larger than the British bomb. With their brand new bomb already obsolete, the British would again have to play catch up to get their own hydrogen bomb. But that's a story for another time. I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more from Newsreel History and help more content get made, please consider subscribing and I'll see you next time.